Oh, okay. you know what? I just have to take a personal moment for a second and tell you something that I've never told an audience before, which is how I got into skepticism and how much I love being here. I've only been, um, my, f I published, okay, my background, I was a, um, I am a professor of biology at a community college. I specialize in teaching non-major science. So people who don't want to be scientists when they grow up. And I was teaching intro bio, which is the most commonly taken course for non-science majors around the country. I'm a biologist. I love biology. I was doing my best to convince students that biology was awesome and that understanding it was important to their lives. And I finally realized, like 12 years in, eight textbooks, and a million different ways of teaching it, my students didn't want to be there. Um, they were going to try their best to remember and then regurgitate what I was teaching them and spew it back out on an exam. They were gonna leave hating science as much as when they got to me. And they weren't gonna actually learn anything useful about science that helped them in their daily lives. So I went to my department and I said, I think we need to talk about why we teach non-majors courses. And I go, oh, science literacy, critical thinking, great. Is what we're teaching doing that? And I made an argument against uh, Interbio to their credit they let me cancel the course Ooh. and replace it with a course that is designed to, what I say, teach skills, not facts. And those three skills align perfectly. <laughs> it's critical thinking, information literacy, and science literacy. And I teach it in that order. Now, um, it turns out, what is critical thinking? That's actually, if you ask educators that they teach critical thinking, they go, oh, yeah, I do. Great. What is that? How do you do it? Right? And um, I, I have a, a new article, hopefully it's coming out in Skeptical Inquirer soon, about my exploration into the rabbit hole that is what is critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, I, um, do you know Guy Harrison? Yeah. Okay, so Guy Harrison had an article on the cover of Skeptical Inquirer, um, this was in like 2020, and it was um, like the, something about the feeling of the American education system. And in it, he described a course that he thought would be the what students needed. And I had gone through the process of asking myself, if students had, if I had one semester to teach the average person what they needed to know about science, what would that be? And that was the course that I had. So I sent it to Guy, it was on my website, I'd been writing stuff for my website, and I sent it to Guy and I said, you know, I actually agree with you entirely. Um, this is my humble attempt at doing this. And he said, hold everything, here is Ken Frazier's email address. Send him this article, tell him I sent you, and that article was published, I think, in 2021. Um, maybe 20, no, it was January 2022. Um, later that year, uh, I submitted for the Sunday morning papers and was lucky enough to uh, be accepted. I honestly didn't know about PsyCon. I read Skeptical Inquirer sort of tangentially, but it wasn't really a thing. I got to PsyCon and I thought, holy crap, my people are here <laughs> in a place. And I love them and they're so much fun and I have so much in common with them. And since then, I have just been so um, overwhelmed with how wonderful this community is. Um, and that I feel like skepticism kind of has a branding problem, like critical thinking has a branding problem. Because if you ask skeptics, what is, critical th uh, what is skepticism? And I love asking you all this question. So if you want to talk at the bar later, I'm going to ask you that question. Because different people come to this community for different reasons. Now I'm going to give you my humble definition. Um, but we have something here that is too good to keep to ourselves. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, right? I got here to the party and y'all been here for a long time. Um, but I'm ready to do it. <laughs> um, and what I'm going to talk about today is, um, so in my course, I teach um, a progression of skills. Um, when I start with critical thinking, uh, I actually start with witchcraft. So day one, uh, actually day one, I give students the, um, uh, Bertram Four made it famous in the, the 50s, the fake personality assessment. James Randi also did it and so on. I tell my students, I have a friend who is a psychic and she's actually really good and um, she's agreed to offer you free personality assessments and I, I have them fill out their papers and whatever in the next class, like here's your personality assessments. And they're like, whoa, whoa, she gets me. <laughs> right? How accurate is she? And I've been doing this for years. And out of one to five, she's like 4.3 to 4.5 out of five, which is pretty in line with what Forer found. 
great. Get with the person next to you. Talk about your assessment. Why do you think she was so accurate? What in there really spoke to you? And sometimes it takes them 10 or 15 minutes to realize they all got the same reading. <laughs> now, why do I do that? Because I could tell them they could be fooled. But most people are like, yeah, other people are stupid and they can be fooled, but not me. I'm too smart for that. I'm like, okay, hold my beer. I'm going to show you. I'm just going to fool you. And so we make a game out of it, and then I proceed into witchcraft. And I show them the kinds of things people were accused of in, the, in Europe, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, 18th centuries. Um, okay, I show them what they confess to. Why did they confess? Well, let me show you that too. <laughs> Here's how they tortured them. I would confess to anything, quite frankly. Um, okay, how good was that evidence, right? And they all go, wait a minute, that wasn't really very good evidence. Okay, but they were really convinced. They were confident. They were so confident they killed potentially hundreds of thousands of people. Okay, how about you? What are you wrong about? How good is the evidence for your beliefs? And so then we progress into um, skepticism and I, I, I I talk about the limits of, uh, sorry, um, with skepticism, we do psychics. And um, then I move into the limits of perception and memory. I spend, I love the, uh, uh, the illusions. I spend a lot of time on those illusions. Because again, like, we don't realize how easily we can be fooled. And with that, okay, now let's talk about ghosts and UFOs. And through the course of the semester, I'm, um, I'm using this information, but I use a, a, what I call critical thinking training wheels, where I'm purposefully starting with non-triggering misinformation, because it's really difficult to critically evaluate our own beliefs when we are on the line. And so um, some of what I, I teach in my class is what I'm going to do here um, with a story. Do you all know of the doomsday cult from the 50s? So, right, this was technically, um, right now, this is what's thought to have been the first UFO religion. Religion, right, cold. So, um, in the 1950s, there was a woman named Dorothy Martin outside of Chicago, and she was a psychic, and she, was, um, she would talk to her dead father and receive messages. And then her father's voice got replaced with another voice, and it, it got a little bit um, more uh, aggressive, and then it was replaced with, one morning she woke up, so this was the spring of 1954, she woke up, her, um, would you call it a medium, how she expressed her psychic powers was handwriting, automatic handwriting. Yeah. So she woke up one morning and she was receiving a message and she started writing down the message and it was um, Sananda, um, or the reincarnation of Jesus on the planet Clarion. And he told her, um, how to advance her spiritual development and to gather other what they call seekers to follow these guardians, the other aliens on this planet. And so she did. She got a little bit of a following. Um, and so one day they said, we're going to come in our spaceship and we're going to visit you. Go to the nearby Air Force Base. They went out there. There was no flying saucer. Um, but they did notice there was this like strange man there. Uh, later, Dorothy got a message that actually had been Sananda checking on them, just making sure that they were doing what they told her to have them do. She got um, some uh, relatively high profile uh, followers. In particular, she got a local professor. Um, his name is Charles Lawhead. And um, he started to um, proselytize even more than, than her. And um, one day, um, she got a message that the world was going to be destroyed in a global flood and earthquake on December 21st. And that the guardians were going to come rescue the fellow seekers. So they had to prepare. And it was picked up in the local newspaper. And a psychologist, Leon Fessinger, was reading his morning paper over his coffee and saw this and thought, huh, I wonder what would happen on December 22nd when the world didn't end. So he um, had his fellow psychologists, graduate students, um, infiltrate the group and follow them over the next few months to see what would happen. So we're going to come back to this, but let's take a bit of a tangent. 
what are beliefs? Um, beliefs are basically things that you think are true. They don't have to be true. If you accept them as true, they are your beliefs. Now, there's a difference between beliefs and believing and knowing. Um, most uh, philosophers will use what's known as the um, justified true belief. There's exceptions to it. But importantly, um, most of us, when we think we know something, like I, I spend a lot of time communicating science online, and I'll hear people say, well, I don't have beliefs. I know things. <laughs> that, that's, wow, very confident. Um, knowledge, th that feeling of knowing, is actually a feeling. It's the, um, the feeling of certainty that your brain gives to you, often without sufficient justification. But your brain tells you, you're pretty sure about this. I know something. But there are mental models of how you think the world works. And they're useful because they help you predict what might happen next in new situations. You come to them in a variety of ways. I've summarized them broadly by two. One is our personal experiences. I am so grateful that I had fellow speakers today already lay the groundwork for how unreliable our personal experiences can be. We don't experience the world necessarily as it is. Obviously, our personal experiences give us decent information. If not, we would be dead. But they're not perfect. Yet, I find um, one of the most important steps in critical thinking and understanding why science is important is recognizing the limitations of our personal experiences. I know homeopathy works because I tried it and I felt better. I know UFOs are real, because I saw one. I know ghosts are real. I saw a ghost when I was a kid. I, if, for those of you who haven't heard my story, I was about five, my grandma was staying over, and I was sleeping, and I felt this fingernail go up my arm, like really slowly. And I opened my eyes, and there's this old woman, like long straggly hair, white hair, um, and I tried to yell to my grandma to wake up and help me. And she held her hand over my mouth. And I could still feel, I still feel the cold, wrinkly hand. So I tried to yell harder, and she held down my chest. I have no idea how long this lasted. It felt like an eternity. And I don't remember even how it resolved itself. Now, you all know what this is, right? Sleep paralysis. I was probably five, so the scariest thing my brain could come up with was the witch from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. She was terrifying. But that's the thing, is that we explain things using what our brain already knows. If I didn't know what that was, I would tell you to this day, I know ghosts are real. I saw one. So we have to understand how we can be fooled before we understand that we need something like the process of science to help us avoid being fooled. And the other way is through received wisdom, people around us. Right, when you look at a map of global religi religions, they map right, big clusters of people. That's not by accident. We trust um, our, our parents, clergy, uh, teachers. Um, my husband and I like to travel. A few years ago, we were in Vanuatu. And um, remember seeing, do you know the John Frum cult? Mm -hmm. So um, in World War II, the United States government was um, fighting Japan, and we were island hopping our way to Japan. So what we would do is we'd get to a new island, we'd bring in munitions, establish a base, move on, get closer and closer. Well, in Vanuatu, so Vanuatu is this fascinating place. It's like um, an archipelago of a bunch of islands. It's extremely isolated. The people there, when we were there, there were people still living in uh, the Stone Age, basically stone tools, and that was basically what they had. They'd never seen modern technology. Was that the Arthur C. Clarke quote? Um, any advanced civilization is, it, is magic. Like magic yeah. yeah. So they'd never seen airplanes, blue jeans, spam, right? <laughs> and so it's like, wow, this is magic. And so the idea of John from, um, it's probably John from America, mm. but um, they created a religion out of this. So. Um, to this day, every year, I think it's um, February, is it 11th, it's right 15th? Around it's right around Darwin Day. They, they have John Frum Day. And they wear blue jeans and paint USA 
on their chest. They carry American flags. They have like uh, pictures of American uh, like GI Joes. They sing American patriotic songs. They're hoping John Frum comes back and brings them. Yeah. Okay. Now here's the thing. I'm like, wait, that's really weird. But wait a minute. So I started looking into it, and I found this fascinating interview with one of the chiefs, um, and it was, I think, with Smithsonian. And they said, you know, it's been like 80 years at the time. It'd been like 80 years. And you're still waiting for John Fromm to come back. And he's like, it's been 2,000 years, and you're still waiting for Jesus to come back? <laughs> <laughs> you argue with that, right? So why is that weird to me? Because I've not been exposed to it. We have believing brains. It is more difficult to question something than it is to accept it as true. And so especially if it comes from a source we trust, we largely just accept it as true. Skepticism takes more effort. To me, this underscores the importance of knowing who to trust. It is impossible for each of us to know everything. Even if we had firsthand experience, that's not necessarily trustworthy either. So it's important to know where knowledge lives, where reliable knowledge lives. So when you look at all of our beliefs in our head, they form like a, a web, if you imagine it this way, where um, they're all connected via nodes, and they form sort of concentric circles. It's a simplified model, obviously. But here's the core beliefs that we hold most tightly. And then they sort of go out from there. But notice they're all connected. So if I'm talking to somebody, I should say this, the purpose of this talk isn't just to understand ourselves better, but it's to help us understand others better as well. But I think looking inward is the most important first step. Let's say I'm talking to somebody and I'm like, whoa, that is just not true. Their mental model is built with that connected to a bunch of other things. It does not exist in isolation. I can't go in and say, hey, this is wrong. Let's pull that out, because it just leaves a gaping hole. It leaves their mental model incomplete, inconsistent. We would rather have incorrect beliefs that form consistency than have gaping holes. So if we want to know if a belief is true, we first have to ask ourselves, what kind of belief is it? Can it be proven wrong? Scientists use falsifiable or unfalsifiable. You talked earlier, Kenny, about like, is it testable? Basically, same difference. So um, unfalsifiable beliefs, I have organized into, um, this is a difficult concept for students in particular. So I've organized into broad categories. Um, subjective are things like, cats make the best pets. <laughs> I am objectively right about this. OK. Um, actually, I should say, these are some of the ones that they're not falsifiable, but we hold the tightest. And so I'm, when, I'm, when I'm teaching this to students, the, the point isn't necessarily to make sure all of your beliefs are falsifiable. Make sure all of your beliefs are evidence-based. It's to understand the difference. Like, you know what? I think cats are the best pets. I could give you evidence for it. Right? Um, they're quiet. <coughs> they're self-cleaning. I don't have to take them outside to go potty. Look, in Massachusetts in February when it's cold and dark and it's snow on the ground, I look at those suckers out the window with dogs. I'm like, my cat is so civilized. Like, I have evidence for my belief, but it still doesn't mean that the belief is evidence-based. So I need to know that that belief, while it's important to me, is not an evidence-based belief. Um, this would be like, um, Supplements do this a lot um, because they can't make specific health claims. So like it um, strengthen, um, strengthens the immune system or it promotes overall health and wellness. Like that sounds awesome because it doesn't say anything. Or um, you have a need to be liked and admired by people. Right, that's a Barnum statement in the personality assessments I give students beginning of the semester. It doesn't say anything. The power of vague beliefs is their vagueness. We are able to impart what we want on the belief. 
So we have to make sure that we're actually evaluating the belief in the claim as it is and not as we perceive it to be. Supernatural. Now there's exceptions to this, of course. Um, in this, uh, for science classes, like, we cannot test unfalsifiable claims, so they are not part of science. If somebody says God created the universe, I would say that is not part of the process of science. We can't test it. Could it be true? I suppose, but it's not an evidence-based belief, so we will never know for sure. It is not part of this class. If somebody said God caused a global flood, I might say we can't test that. We can test a global flood. So let's say we look for evidence of a global flood or not. Even if we find it, which we don't have, we would still never be able to test the cause as a god. And then finally, this is what we do when we really want a belief to be true. And the evidence is suggesting that it's not. We move the goalpost, we spin and turn and do all kinds of mental gymnastics until, you know what, it's my opinion. I'm entitled to my belief. Conspiracy theorists are masters at this. This is essentially what conspiratorial thinking is. It is constantly reinterpreting evidence to support the conspiracy as opposed to evaluating evidence as it is. Um, now in class, I don't use triggering examples. So like I don't do the, um, the global flood. Do you know Thagoras, the Thagorean theorem guy? Um, so he thought, amongst a variety of weird things, that when you farted, you lost part of your soul. <laughs> so he wouldn't eat beans. He was afraid. Um, there is rumors, there's some that that might have been part of what killed him. Um, nevertheless, so I'll tell my students, you know, they laugh. Great, test that. Wait, what? Yeah, test that. And so. Every time the conversation goes something like this. Do you lose your soul when you burp too? I don't know, you tell me. Okay, um, my dog farts. Do dogs have souls? I don't know. Uh, my favorite, if somebody else farts and I breathe it in, do I get part of their soul? <laughs> Until they'll finally go, well wait a minute, how do you test a soul? How do you measure a soul? And I'm like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> you can't, and that's the point. The reason I tell you that story too is that I think it's important to, if we can get to an issue as skeptics without addressing these, um, like build a foundation of these non-triggering examples to give people the opportunity to practice that and let them go to the bigger stuff. Um, Start a war. I hate this dress so much. Oh, okay, who sees it as blue and black? All right, who sees it as uh, gold and white? <laughs> I used to see it as gold and white, and I couldn't get it Does anybody see it as something different? Because you're colorblind. Yeah, okay. We're gonna chalk that up to just Rob. <laughs> now here's the thing. I see gold and white because I'm also a photographer, and I see the overexposure in the background. By the way, is what's the color in that picture? <laughs> yes. no, I'm kidding. It depends. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it because look, we've all seen the dress, yeah. Yeah. but it's still awesome to be in a room full of people and go, wait a minute, really? You see that as something different? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, you can start a fight over something like this. <laughs> Again, it's a dress. Who really cares? Except, imagine this, this is a dress and we're seeing the colors differently. Now, the goal here is to change the conversation from <laughs> how in the world do you see that's gold and white? You're so stupid. To, whoa, you actually see that differently. Tell me more. What's the actual, could I be wrong? What is the color of that dress? Let's work this out together. So address this as a chance to work together to get closer to the truth. That's what the process of science is. It recognizes that we're each individually biased, fallible, we make mistakes, we don't perceive reality as it is, but there is a reality outside of our head. So 
diversity offers us a chance to have more testable hypotheses. But we have to listen and then be open to testing our own as well. In um, psychology, there's a, a concept called naive realism, which is um, we think we perceive the world as it is. When someone does not perceive the world as we do, we think, oh, wow, you're stupid. How do you see it that way? You must be misinformed. Let me give you the facts. Or, wow, you're evil. We need to realize our own potential um, limitations and model being open to changing our minds. We don't have all of the answers individually. George Carlin, Carlin said it better than I could. Because yeah. <laughs> here's the thing. My position is the right one. I have thought about it. I have followed the evidence. You're stupid. You're stupid. I'm right. Now, our expectations can influence what we see. We can be primed to see things. Now, throughout all of human history, we didn't see flying saucers until we started to have these movies and comic books and theme parks. And we had UFO. For the first time in human history, there was a chance that humans would leave the atmosphere. And we started to have this infatuation with what is out there. So this 1954 Dorothy Martin seeker cult um, they were seeing what they were primed to see, what they expected to see. And even with the same information, we can reach different conclusions. So this is pew polling of um, the, um, how well the economy is perceived to be by those who lean right and lean left. Now, what happened here? 2001, 2001. Oh, yeah. Yes. Who? George W. Bush. All of a sudden, Republicans thought, oh, the economy is awesome. Democrats are like, oh, it's in the toilet. What happened here? Obama. All of a sudden, Democrats thought it was better. What happened here? Have you ever watched a sporting event with someone who is rooting for the other team? They literally see a different game. Literally see a different game. Protest. There are studies on protests. You show people a protest with different signs, literally the same protests with the same signs. If they're on the side of the protesters, they're not violent. If they're not on the side of the protesters, they're violent. It's the same information. We're just perceiving it differently. And we now live in an environment where we have our own realities online. We've already established algorithms are feeding us more of what we expect, what we want to see, more of what confirms our worldview. And so is it any wonder we come out of our filter bubbles with all of our beliefs based on our tribes and our identities and our expectations and our pre-existing beliefs and go, what in the world are you talking about? Um, you know Daniel Kahneman's System 1, System 2. Uh, those are hard for students. I like Jonathan Haidt's Elephant and the Rider. The idea being, imagine in your head you have an elephant with a rider on top of the elephant. The elephant is the part of the brain that is emotional, biased. It uses its intuitions. It uses what it already knows. It jumps to conclusions. It's also always on. You don't have to think about it. The rider is the part of your brain that can think critically. It's also the part of your brain that you think is in control, but it's not. The elephant is really hard to control. It's an elephant. So actually, most of the time, what happens is the elephant jumps to a conclusion based on what it already expects, its beliefs, its biases, its emotions, its self-interest. It suggests a conclusion to your writer. And your writer goes, sounds about right. Here are all the reasons why I'm right. And the more we're motivated to defend the elephant's conclusions, the better we can get at it. So we think we do this. We think our writer is in control. 
and it follows the body of evidence using reasoning and logic to go to a conclusion. Actually, what normally happens is we start with a desired conclusion. That's from our elephant, from our tribe, from our identity, our emotions. And then we use the tools at our disposal to get to the evidence that we need to make us feel better that our elephant is right. I would like to tell you that being intelligent or educated protects against this. There's actually some studies that suggest the opposite. The smarter we are, the better we are at defending conclusions, even if they're wrong. One step more, if I have an elephant that's suggesting things to my writer, and my writer is finding all these justifications, so does Susan, and so do all of us. So I think I'm talking to Susan. We think it's a writer conversation. There's four people in this conversation. These are elephant conversations. My elephant is talking to her elephant. And we're pretending that it's a fact-based conversation. But it's not. Our elephants are rampaging, especially if it's an emotional. I think they should, we should have ice cream. <laughs> yes. Let me give you all the reasons. I've been really good today. I worked out yesterday. I can eat oh the ice gosh, cream. Vacation. I can eat Calories don't count on vacation. I know. I think that they're, I think it cal it's milk. Milk is very, very uh, good. Protein? Yeah, the, the tree of life and all that stuff. Four free fruit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a complete protein. Yeah. Perfect food. So we're more motivated to defend beliefs tied to our identity. This is in the web of beliefs, that stuff in the middle. The more we see these beliefs as tied to who we are, we don't want to be wrong. It's not that our beliefs are wrong, we are wrong. Actually, the part of the brain that, is the, um, that gets activated in the um, physical threat is also activated when we are faced with evidence that one of these core beliefs is wrong. And, we are more motivated to um, defend beliefs tied to our tribes. Have you ever noticed um, how it's easier to disagree with somebody in a different tribe than it is in our own? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Being disagreeing with members of our tribe means that we might actually risk our social group, mm -hmm. our, our belonging. Now, our tribes almost certainly aren't right about everything. But we've adopted those beliefs, and we defend them like good members of our social groups. But it's almost impossible that our tribes are right about everything. And then what happens is the overconfidence cycle. So motivated reasoning helps us find the evidence that we need. Confirmation bias is our tendency to find, interpret. Um, how much time do I have? You have 10 minutes. My husband and I love to play cards. Um, one of our favorite card games is golf. Doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I don't like to lose. <laughs> so um, <laughs> We start a new game, and I'm like, oh my god, you're going to beat me again. He's like, what are you talking about? You win all the time. No, you always win. You won the last time. Now, here's the thing. He's been keeping score, so we have long-term data, which he's probably, he's pulling up right now. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't know this and I wouldn't believe him if he wasn't keeping score. Because my memory is flawed that way. That's my confirmation bias kicking in. And then overconfidence kicks in. Um, Daniel Kahneman was once asked if he had a magic wand that would rid the world of one bias, what would it be? And he said overconfidence. Because you can't learn. You won't change your mind if you're overconfident that you're right. Okay, so what happened? Um, so they um, were told that the end of the world was December 21st, but that the aliens could actually come at any time, so they had to be ready. And they had, um, like, December 17th, they got a phone call from Captain Video from outer space, like, the aliens are coming now. Go out to the backyard and the flying saucer has come. No flying saucer. Um, that was actually a popular TV show at the time. They got pranked. 
Um, it happened again a couple days later. Uh, the aliens are coming, no aliens. Um, they thought, well, what went wrong? So they were told that their um, metal would interact with the UFO energy field or something. So they had to not have any metal on. So somebody, you know, they had taken out their zippers and like tooth fillings. And, and so they thought, well, wait, somebody must have had metal on. Like they're trying to find reasons why the aliens didn't come. But the end of the world was going to be December 21st. So that was the date. Now, on that date, can you imagine? Some of them, um, they were mocked. They um, gave up their jobs. They gave up their money. Why would they need money? The world was going to end. They lost custody of their kids. They moved in with Dorothy. And the more they were mocked, the more they had to believe they were right, and the more insular they became. So this was the day they were finally going to be shown they were right. The world was going to end, they were going to be saved, this nightmare was going to be over. At midnight, there was no aliens. They thought, what happened? And somebody noticed the clock was wrong, like five minutes fast. So they still had time. They started singing Christmas carols. Mm -hmm. World's coming mm -hmm. to an end. Um, OK, two hours later, we need to take a coffee break. Aliens told me. And so, I think it was like four or something in the morning. There's still no aliens. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? Um, Fessinger's group describes them as like sitting in like stunned silence. What is wrong? What had they missed? And then Dorothy got a message. The world was not going to end because their belief had saved the world. Um, Notice how they were able to find justifications that protected that belief. This is uh, Fessinger's uh, theory of cognitive dissonance. They reduced cognitive dissonance by using motivated reasoning to find the justifications they needed to not have to change their minds. And not only that, they were so right, they saved the world. Thank you very much. Charles Lawhead said, I've had to go a long way. I've given up just about everything. I've cut every tie. I've burned every bridge. I've turned my back on the world. I can't afford to doubt. I have to believe. Hmm. There isn't any other truth. The more we've been mocked, the more we've been ostracized, the harder it is to change our minds. And this is an important lesson for all of us. We don't like to be wrong in general, and the more we've been mocked for something, and the more we put ourselves out there for a belief, the harder it is to be wrong. They had lost all of their ties. This to me shows that if you have somebody in your life who has fallen in that path, to be their place where they can still go, to not be mocked. Hmm. Hmm. So why don't facts change our minds? Because it's not about facts. On the surface, it looks like I have my facts and I'm arguing with you over these facts, but actually our elephants are motivated by these underlying issues. And we're using the facts to protect what the elephant is wanting to believe. It's not about facts. If you're having a conversation with somebody, remember, your elephant is probably in control. Ask yourself, what is your elephant up to? What does it want to believe? And remember, don't talk to their writer, because that's not where it's coming from. Talk to their elephant. So the take home messages here. Your writer is capable of thinking critically. It is hard work to control the elephant. It can be done, so think critically. And talk to their elephants. It is not about facts. Uh, I don't have time for this, but I use this on um, my, to help my students think critically through beliefs. If, I, if you want me to and I have time later, I can certainly go through this with you. It's also useful to talk to somebody else. So. I'll keep going and come back if you want me to. Um, I asked this at the beginning, what is skepticism? So to me, when somebody asks me what skepticism is, I like David Hume uh, proportioning our beliefs to the evidence. It's that part of your brain that says, wait, is that true? And if you don't ask yourself that question, you're just going to believe. So listen to it, turn it on. Skepticism is not denial or cynicism. It's also, well, this is what it gets confused with. But gullibility is the opposite end of this. And I have it like a spectrum like this, but it's more like a, a horseshoe. Because here's, when we want to believe something or don't 
want to believe something, oftentimes they are related. And so we deny some things and accept some things. It's all in service of what the elephant is wanting to believe. OK, Carl Sagan. And the way that skepticism is sometimes applied to issues of public concern, there's a tendency to belittle, to condescend, to ignore the fact that, <coughs> deluded or not, supporters of superstition and pseudoscience are human beings with real feelings who, like skeptics, are trying to figure out how the world works and what our role in it might be. Their motives are, in many cases, consonant with science. If their culture hasn't given them all the tools they need to pursue this great quest, hmm. let's temper our criticism with kindness. Hmm. None hmm. of us comes fully equipped. We've discovered tools. We can help other people with those tools. But we have to be kind hmm. and connect on the elephant level and be empathetic. If you're curious to know however this goes on social media, I posted this on my Facebook today. You can look at some of the comments. Surviving mm. ones, of course, because I did block some people. Mm. Um, so my website is thinking is power because knowledge is not enough, mm. right? There's too much to know. We carry access to basically all of it in mm. our pockets. The better question is when you need information, can you find it mm. and use it to make better decisions? Uh, my website, I would really appreciate follows on social media. So if you're on any of those channels, that would be really wonderful. Um, and thank you to all of the um, skeptics here for being such an awesome community and to the um, Triangle Skeptics for um, hosting this event and allowing me to uh, participate. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.